I'm very pleased to introduce to you uh, Professor Ed Kite, Edwin Kite. He's a professor at University of Chicago, where he leads the Solar System and Exoplanet Habitability Research Group, very apropos to our, uh, to our group, and is a participating scientist in the uh, Mars Curiosity rover. rover. He's a, a planetary geoscientist with research emphasizing Mars, icy moons, and rocky exoplanets. He received uh, uh, fairly recently the uh, uh, AGU uh, Greeley Early Career Award in Planetary Science and is a co-recipient of the AAS uh, Newcomb Cleveland Prize. Uh, uh, he uh, received his undergraduate and graduate training at Cambridge and at, uh, at Cal, that is Berkeley. Um, he's going to be talking to us if uh, his computer uh, is successful uh, uh, about exoplanet atmosphere recipes. Ed, are you uh, more or less ready there? Uh, can you see my screen? Yep. And so the usual process is uh, is uh, about uh, 40, 45 minutes of discussion, of talk, and then uh, a free for all questions. Uh, thank you uh, very much uh, for the invitation. Uh, sorry for the uh, Zoom trouble. Um, so uh, uh, this talk is about exoplanet atmosphere recipes. I'd like to thank uh, all of the collaborators uh, shown here. Um, so uh, what we're looking at, uh, hopefully, is a plot of exoplanets uh, against uh, orbital period. OK, great. Um, so exoplanets everywhere. This is a great scientific achievement. Um, the falloff you see is basically detectability bias. Um, so the data in hand is uh, consistent with about half the stars in the galaxy having roughly Earth-sized planets at the right distance from the stars to have habitable surfaces. So how many of these planets have atmospheres that could per uh, permit surface liquid water of a geologic type? And the answer to this question is still unknown. So Mars's atmosphere is right on the cusp of being too thin for liquid water, about six millibars of carbon dioxide. Now the triple point of water is six millibar pressure, below which liquid water is unstable to internal boiling. So Mars today has no surface liquid water. The partial pressure of water vapor is far below six millibar. It's a really cold place. So any liquid water exposed to the surface will quickly evaporate. And because of the evaporative cooling, it will freeze. Very little greenhouse effect, only a few Kelvin from that thin CO2 atmosphere. Mars did have a thicker atmosphere in the past, however. Uh, and at Jupiter, we have the opposite problem, of course. There is no solid surface. As we go down through the hydrogen helium dominated atmosphere, we pass through the temperature range consistent with liquid water, staying in the gas phase, and we pass into plasma. So Jupiter formed by gas accretion onto a seed of rock and water ice. And though we can still see the gravitational signature of that seed at Jupiter's core, the temperature pressure was far too high for either the solid or liquid uh, stayed at Jupiter core conditions. So only Earth in our solar system has the right conditions for liquid water, surface liquid water. So today, first I'll introduce exoplanet atmospheres, sources, and sinks. And then I'll uh, talk about the sub Neptune to super Earth transition. And I'll explain what those terms mean um, as an example of exoplanet atmosphere recipes. So atmosphere uh, uh, presence and absence and atmosphere composition both reflect the balance between volatile loss and volatile gain. And uh, volatiles are key to habitability because they constitute the habitable environment, the solvent uh, for life in the case of water, and the building blocks for life in the case of carbon species, and because volatile gases regulate the climate state. And the key period for both volatile supply and volatile loss is the first 100 million years or so of our planet's history. That's where volatiles are supplied to the habitable zone, and it's also when volatile loss processes are most intense. So uh, this graph uh, uh, summarizes our understanding of a couple of loss drivers. Um, so uh, the solar wind is shown uh, by uh, the gash blue line. And uh, this is a log scale, and it's much more intense uh, early in uh, a sun-like star's uh, lifetime. And the EUV, uh, shown by the green track, Again, much more intense early in uh, a sun-like star's lifetime. And what these two things do together is they strip away the top of the atmosphere. Uh, they uh, uh, heat and thus puff up the uppermost atmosphere, make it vulnerable to hydrodynamic escape. And in the case of solar wind, uh, you could uh, ablate the top of the atmosphere. 
So um, atmosphere sources include gas from the nebula and volatiles locked up in solids, for example, released from asteroids uh, uh, as the impact or from comets as the impact. And so uh, sometimes you have uh, gas from the nebula uh, dominating a planet's atmosphere. Example, Jupiter, uh, often called primary atmospheres. And sometimes you have uh, planets that have uh, atmospheres with gas, mostly from solid derived volatiles, example, Earth. Um, and those are often called secondary atmospheres. Terminology is mostly historical, but uh, it's widely enough used that uh, um, uh, it's, it's worth knowing. So here's um, planet's escape velocity on the x axis against insulation on the y axis. There's a lot going on here, so I'll take uh, a couple of minutes to explain it. So wells in the bottom right are gas jets. Wells in the top left have no atmosphere. And wells close to the diagonal green line have a chance to have atmospheres, but not turn into gas jets. So you want some atmosphere, but not too much if you want to have a habitable surface. So uh, the diagonal green line is just a rough guide uh, for the eye. And the authors of this paper called it the cosmic shoreline, uh, the idea being that you want to be uh, close to it uh, to be habitable. Um, the faint yellow uh, horizontal band is the water vapor runaway greenhouse limit. So above that line, liquid water oceans turn into supercritical, supercritical water, which is very bad for life. Um, the uh, solid uh, light blue curved line underneath the faint yellow line, uh, that's for retaining a water atmosphere. So if you're to the left of that, it's really hard to hang on to water vapor because it will just boil away to space. But if you're to the right of that, then you can hang on uh, to water vapor. So uh, right away, uh, we're starting to uh, trace out a zone in planet size. So the bigger, uh, the bigger more mass of the planet, the higher the escape velocity and planet insulation space that's uh, suitable for a habitable uh, a, a, an atmosphere that could support a habitable surface environment. Um, and so uh, Proxima Centauri B is the closest exoplanet. It's a roughly Earth mass planet and it is in the habitable zone. So it will almost certainly be visited by spacecraft in the future. Proxima B's host star, uh, Proxima Centauri, is a red dwarf. Uh, red dwarfs have a uh, long phase of relatively high uh, brightness early in their history. Um, and so that's why you see three gold symbols here. These are three different stages in Proxima Centauri B's evolution. So this is where it is today. But for maybe 100 million years on its history, it was exposed to so much light from the star that it would have been above the royal greenhouse limit. Um, too hot for life before entering the habitable zone, which is where it is today. Um, so here are some uh, key processes in uh, atmospheric escape, um, you know, turning a world uh, with a uh, habitability permitting atmosphere into, into a bare rock, uh, solar wind stripping, uh, large impacts can remove the atmosphere. Uh, you can have chemical reactions with surface materials drawing down the atmosphere. You can have condensation. So uh, our uh, carbon dioxide condenses at Mars's poles, uh, water condenses into our oceans. And you can also have a thermal escape. Um, so uh, hydrodynamic loss and also boil off at the top of the planet's atmosphere. So all of these, you have to track all of these uh, if you're going to even make a prediction about what uh, worlds have um, atmospheres and what don't. And so we shouldn't expect to get it right uh, just by guessing. We're going to need a lot of data to guide us. So here's what some of that data looks like. So um, these are the two most common classes of known exoplanets. Um, so the clump up here uh, are sub-Neptunes, and the clump down here are super Earths. So um, there are, um, uh, you know, after correction for detection um, biases, there are one or two on average of each of these classes per star. Uh, so we actually don't have any um, short period uh, super Earths and sub Neptunes in our own uh, uh, solar system, uh, but they're so common, um, uh, uh, multi planet systems are so common around other stars at short orbital period. There are one or two of uh, each of these classes on average per star. Um, so uh, what we see here is a view of the gulf that separates super Earths from sub Neptunes. There aren't many red dots in between 1.6 and 2 Earth radius. Um, and uh, below the black line, we have super Earth sized planets, which mostly have a density consistent with Earth like composition. So they might have thin atmospheres like our own, or they might have no atmospheres, we're not sure. And the shortage of super Earths out at 30 days 
is partly that they're hard to, to detect, but it's partly real. So these super Earths are mostly, uh, uh, you know, much closer uh, to their star than Mercury is to the sun in our own solar system. Um, so is this gap between 1.6 Earth radii and two Earth radii uh, a formation signature or an evolution signature? Although we don't know for sure, there's strong indirect evidence that it's an evolution signature. By this, I mean, most planets form with thick hydrogen atmospheres inherited from the nebula. So primary atmospheres, hydrogen gas, uh, hydrogen dominated gas from the nebula, um, say a 3000 kilometer thick atmosphere overlying a 10,000 kilometer radius magma sphere, like the blue over red cartoon in the bottom left, where hopefully you can see my cursor. So that puts them into the top clump of planets, the big sub -nectrins. Um, then after the nebula has dispersed, the uh, uh, some of these wells in the top clump lose gas and uh, move into uh, the lower clump. So they become uh, bare rocks. But the planets that start with uh, a lot of atmosphere, even after this loss process, they still have thick hydrogen atmospheres, so they stay in the sub neptune clump. Okay, so that's a conceptual picture. Um, so here's a, a summary of a, of a model for, for how, it, how it works. Um, so uh, this is erosion of atmosphere as a function of time for planet models with a range of initial envelopes. So long time scale, which is plotting higher on this plot, uh, means more stable. Um, so low mass envelopes are stripped clean. Um, they have short loss time scales, while higher mass envelopes are herded towards envelope mass fractions of about one weight percent. That doesn't sound much, but it's enough to double the planet's radius. Um, so it turns the super Earth into a sub neptune So most of the atmospheric erosion is happening early because the extreme, or in this model, because most of the extreme ultraviolet plug from the star is high early on. So that's why we're not really seeing different stages in this process in this diagram. We're just seeing the end result because the XUV uh, dose that removes the planet, that removes the hydrogen happens early on. Um, Okay, so um, I now want to uh, uh, talk a little bit more about this uh, sub neptune to super Earth uh, transition as an example of uh, how you make an exoplanet's atmosphere. Um, so uh, a key to understanding atmospheric composition is understanding exchanges between the planet's atmosphere and interior uh, during formation and evolution. So the picture I just described, you have a sort of... Um, thermally and chemically inert uh, uh, magma underlying the hydrogen. But that's all right. Uh, it's magma, so it's not thermally inert. And it's also going to chemically react with the hydrogen. So what happens when we include these factors? And so that'll be the focus of uh, uh, most of the rest of the talk. So um, uh, small radius exoplanets that don't have uh, solar system analogs uh, and are slightly bigger or slightly hotter than the Earth uh, are very numerous. Uh, super Earths and sub are both examples. Um, so um, studying these exoplanets can help us probe the delivery and distribution of life essential volatile species, uh, chemical elements and compounds like water vapor and carbon containing molecules that uh, form atmospheres and oceans, regulate climate, and on Earth uh, make up the biosphere. So measuring abundances of these volatiles on worlds that orbit closer to their star than the habitable zone. So too hot for life is relatively easy to do. Uh, the signal to noise is higher. Uh, but these measurements, even though they're gonna be measurements of uninhabitable planets, they are fundamental to understanding habitability because volatile species abundances on these closer in worlds will help us understanding the volatile delivery and uh, loss processes that operate within habitable zones. Um, so thousands of exoplanets uh, smaller than Neptune uh, have been confirmed to exist. Um, and so here's one of the best cases so far. Uh, so this is K218b. So this is Hubble data. Uh, this is Spitzer Space Telescope data. This is Kepler Space Telescope data. Combine those and you have a spectral uh, feature interpreted as water. Um, and uh, also thanks, to, we, we know that the molecular weight is low. So it's a hydrogen dominated atmosphere. Otherwise the amplitude of this feature, water feature would be suppressed. But uh, the authors of this paper write, our model allows for uh, a bunch of other chemical species, but we find that only water is required by the data, and that including the other molecules has virtually no impact on the best fit to the data. 
Um, so we need James Webb Space Telescope. This is uh, our best pre-JWST information for a sub-Neptune. Um, so we need better telescopes. And uh, this is a beautiful site. Uh, this is our last uh, spatially resolved uh, image of JWST uh, heading out to uh, Earth's on Lagrange 2, uh, about a million kilometers away from the Earth, uh, which will give us detailed spectra of uh, uh, many exoplanet atmospheres. So uh, this was published a couple of months ago, um, or um, sorry, um, this was public a couple of months ago. I don't think it will actually be published, published for a couple more months. Um, and this is a, a, a James Webb uh, spectrum of an exoplanet. Um, so what's nice is the uh, relatively small error bars and a clear detection of uh, carbon dioxide, which actually hadn't previously been definitively detected in exoplanet atmosphere. Um, this is a hot Jupiter. It's not a sub-Neptune. Uh, but it gives us a taste of the sub spectra that will be uh, becoming public over uh, the next 12, uh, 12 to 18 months. So with this high spectral resolution over a wide wavelength range, where space telescope will be able to probe not just uh, puffy low molecular weight atmospheres like those of K2A-T-B, but also high molecular weight atmospheres like that of Earth. Um, and uh, so that will be uh, demanding, uh, but uh, um, the data are being acquired now. Um, so um, in addition to exoplanet atmospheric compositions, we do want to understand their uh, demographics, their radius distribution as a function of period. So uh, I, as far as I know, this is the best current picture of those demographics, although it's not detectability corrected. So the tight error bars on individual planets are uh, thanks to uh, oh, constraints um, on the host star radius. Uh, if you know the uh, uh, size of um, the host star, then you can convert the fractional dip in light from the star when the planet passes in front of it to the absolute radius uh, of the planet. Um, so the first big feature is the radius valley, which I mentioned before, which uh, divides the sub neptune clump from the clump of super Earth sized exoplanets. This valley is even more planet free than it appears here uh, due to measurement uncertainty and a couple of other confounding factors. The second feature is the sharp drop off of planets above three Earth radius. This is uh, the radius cliff. So this is the valley, this is the cliff. Um, so we'd like to understand uh, why these features exist. Uh, today, today I will suggest that the demographics and the atmosphere composition are connected that we can use atmosphere compositions to test theories for the origin of these demographic features, the radius valley, between 1.6 and 2 oh. and 3, not many exoplanets, and the radius cliff, uh, planet's abundance in the universe just falls off above 3 Earth radius. Uh, now, uh, for the remainder of this talk, I'm just going to assume the physical picture that sub neptunes are hydrogen uh, dominate or uh, hydrogen rich atmospheres overlying uh, Earth composition cores. We don't know that. That's an assumption. Uh, but there is strong but indirect statistical evidence for it, and it'll be tested pretty soon by Webb. Uh, so I'm not going to, you know, repeat, um, but refer you to Moses et al. 2020 for an alternative view. Okay, so what are the uh, radius ranges at which different atmosphere interior exchange processes will matter? Um, well, uh, when an exoplanet is very large or very massive, it gathers so much gas that the atmosphere will be low molecular weight with most of the volatiles in the atmosphere. Also, the high temperatures and pressures at the base of the atmosphere favor full miscibility with underlying dense materials, which actually tends to induce density stratification, which suppresses the mixing, suppresses the convection. So for giant planets like Jupiter, we think of atmospheric metallicity as connected not to the what's the seed or the nucleus, the few Earth mass object right at the heart of Jupiter on which the gas underwent runaway accretion, but instead due to planetesimal contamination, so late stage uh, uh, rocks dissolving in Jupiter's massive envelope. Uh, but for the smaller exoplanets that James Webb will uncover, there are several ways in which atmosphere interior exchange can be absolutely crucial for setting atmosphere composition. And, you know, in the limit of like an Earth like planet, basically all the gas is volcanic. So it's all atmosphere interior exchange in that sense. So the question is well, where do you switch from the gas giant planetesimal contamination process to the Earth like, oh, it's all volcanic gas process? Um, and, uh, okay, so mechanism, uh, volcanic outgassing is familiar, um, but another mechanism is atmosphere dissolution into the magma. And another mechanism is atmosphere interior redox reactions. For example, the reaction shown here between iron oxide uh, dissolved in the magma 
and hydrogen gas from the nebula, that makes metallic iron and water. So the atmosphere ends up enriched in water. The effect of redox reactions can be seen by counting the redox exchangeable electrons. So hydrogen molecule has two electrons and iron atom has up to three redox exchangeable electrons. So the hydrogen added to the planet is one weight percent of the planet. You're around the point where the atmosphere and the magma have a similar number of redox exchangeable electrons. Much more than one weight percent of the atmosphere overwhelms the redox buffer of the magma, much less than one weight percent of the magma might buffer the atmosphere. So the boundaries between these regimes in the real universe are not well understood. I'm doing a sort of, you know, uh, mass balance argument that only works if you have full uh, uh, exchange between the atmosphere and the, uh, the magma. And we don't know if we actually get full exchange, um, but this is a, uh, um, a useful limit on how, on how big plants can get and still have the magma be a big control uh, on the atmosphere composition. Okay, so simple models uh, suggest that sub Neptunes, uh, so some examples are shown here, um, uh, have deep long lived magma oceans. So we think of the magma ocean as a transient phase in the Earth's evolution. So right after the movement of the impact, you might have a magma ocean for a million years. Uh, and you also uh, apparently had a magma ocean on the, on the young moon. But on sub-Neptunes, because they have so much hydrogen in the atmospheres, such a strong green aspect, the accretional heat doesn't escape. And instead, uh, you have a multi-Earth mass magma ocean lasting for billions of years. Um, so the x-axis uh, is basically how close is the exoplanet to its host star. So most of the ones I've been showing you are at the temperature of planet Mercury in our system or hotter, so somewhere around here. Um, and the y-axis is how thick is the atmosphere. And uh, uh, your typical sub neptune is somewhere up here. And so that puts you in a zone where your silicate is fully molten. And that matters because molten silicate can dissolve a lot of volatiles, whereas solid silicate, uh, uh, solid bulk silicate earth uh, uh, composition material uh, rejects most of the volatiles. Um, okay. Um, so, um, uh, so I'm going to focus today on sub Neptunes, but I just wanted to put them in the context of um, other exotic, meaning no solar system analog classes of exoplanet that we know are there. We're going to get data from Webb very soon, and that even though they are almost all uninhabitable, will tell us a lot about the uh, atmosphere supply and atmosphere removal processes that are going to control habitability in the habitable zone. Um, so, strict. So, 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 why am I talking about these uh, uninhabitable uh, planets to a habitability uh, uh, seminar? Um, because the, uh, observing strict Earth analog exoplanets, Earth sized planets orbiting within the habitable zone of a Sun like star is extraordinarily difficult and will remain so even with James Webb and with extremely large telescopes on the ground. So, uh, in coming years, it will be much easier to gather data on and to test hypotheses that. Uh, about the processes that generate and sustain habitability using wells like these. And so uh, my uh, co-author Laura Kreutberg uh, uh, coined these Earth Cousins. Um, so by Earth Cousins, we just mean small radius exoplanets that lack solar system analogs, but are more accessible to observations because they're a bit bigger or a bit hotter than the Earth. So for these smaller worlds, as for the Earth, a key to understanding atmospheric composition is understanding exchange between the planet's atmosphere and interior during planet formation and evolution. This exchange often occurs at interfaces, for example, surfaces between uh, uh, atmospheres and silicate materials. And for many small exoplanets, these interfaces exhibit uh, pressure temperature composition regimes very different from Earth's and that have as yet uh, been little explored in laboratory and numerical experiments. So this is a tremendous uh, opportunity actually for uh, lab work and for computer modeling. Uh, just to understand these interfaces and then you know scale it up and build it up uh, to 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 planet uh, chemical models. Um, okay. Uh, oh yes. Sorry. Um, okay. So. Um, okay. So shifting now from work. Uh, done by the community as a whole to work by my group and our collaborators. Um, so uh, talking about sub-Neptunes, um, uh, statistically, 
are not as common as stars, blurring the boundary between terrestrial plants and gas giants, and part of the motivation for the ice giant probe just ranked number one for NASA's next solar system flagship by the Planetary Science uh, and Astrobiology Decadal Survey. Uh, that came out a few months ago. Um, so um, here's a simple model of the evolution of a sub neptune into a super-Earth. Um, so uh, focusing on the uh, consequences for atmospheres of adding a bunch of hydrogen gas and then removing a bunch of hydrogen gas. So um, it's not uh, uh, a symmetric process. Uh, so adding and then removing a hydrogen atmosphere uh, draws out a water atmosphere. So the planet passes through a stage with a water atmosphere, even though we have not added any water to a planet. So this is an endogenic water source. I'm not adding comets. Um, and uh, endogenic water production is not a new idea. It was proposed in the 1980s by the Kyoto School as an option for making Earth's ocean. We no longer think that Earth's ocean was made this way, but it might work for exoplanets. So um, in our model, this outcome of uh, generating uh, a water atmosphere, uh, actually a pure water atmosphere, uh, just by adding and removing hydrogen, um, can be understood as follows. First, the early uh, magma atmosphere reaction transfers electrons from hydrogen to Fe2+, forming dense iron metal, so iron zero, which sinks to the liquid iron core. Um, so that is the reaction in the uh, top left. So this oxidation of the magma atmosphere system is irreversible because chemical re-equilibration between the liquid iron core and the magma is uh, forbidden in our model. It's a slow process because of the huge density contrast. Second, the water atmosphere is buffered by dissolved water. So water is very soluble in, uh, uh, um, uh, in magma, more soluble than hydrogen. So as I turn on the atmosphere removal process, I'm not removing a mix of hydrogen and water. I'm removing almost pure hydrogen because most of that water is um, buried within the interior. And so the atmospheric mean molecular weight stays low. Instead, the water reservoir is mostly uh, within the uh, um, uh, dissolved in the, in the magma. So it's protected from the loss process. So now it's just distillation. I'm removing mostly hydrogen, leaving the water behind. And so the atmospheric mean molecular weight gets higher and higher and higher as I remove more and more mass. Um, so, okay, so why is the dissolved reservoir so massive? It's massive because uh, water is soluble in magma and also because the iron oxide hydrogen reaction is volatilizing the oxygen from the magma, which increases the mass of volatiles, makes it harder to get rid of uh, the volatiles just because there's more mass. So if magma atmosphere interaction is efficient early in the sub Neptune's history, then during sub Neptune to super Earth conversion, most of the reduction in atmospheric volume occurs while most of the volatile mass remains. So this is stage two. So this is a planet with uh, an atmosphere that is, is thin compared to the planet's radius, but it's still, uh, you know, uh, about a hundred bars of water, so so a thick atmosphere. Um, so what this means is that just because you're below the radius valley, that doesn't mean that you are a bare rock. You could be in this stage two with a water atmosphere instead of a hydrogen atmosphere. Um, so the main weakness of this idea is that we don't know if magma atmosphere interaction is efficient on small subnetrics. So here I'm just assuming that the magma is stirred enough uh, that it can react with the hydrogen. That might not be the case, um, it, um, but if it is, um, then it can be, uh, it, th that produces an immediate test, which is that um, most of the exoplanets in this green zone uh, will have a thick, uh, oh, sorry, will we'll have, you know, 10 to 100 bar water vapor atmospheres um, overlying, uh, overlying magma. And there'll be, uh, there'll be a lot more, um, uh, these plants should have volatile oxygen to carbon ratio much greater than one because the enormous amounts of water swamp any carbon species delivered by plant cesspools. Um, so in contrast, uh, another team, uh, Dan Bauer et al, uh, 2022 in the archive, predict that due to uh, differential solubility, super Earth atmospheres should be carbon dominated uh, without the effect that I've described. So that's uh, imminently testable because we can see carbon dioxide with wet. So there are two ways to make a high molecular weight atmosphere on a hot supra. The previous idea on the left and our idea on the right. An interesting extension not yet attempted uh, might be to figure out the consequences for the radius valley uh, of uh, uh, some of the ideas uh, I've described. Um, so 
this uh, result uh, from our 2021 paper uh, caps a uh, research program that we've uh, published since I uh, last gave a talk at uh, UT Austin, uh, which I'll now summarize. Um, so, uh, most, almost all models of subductions treat the core as chemically inert, uh, but there are a couple of exceptions. Um, so, uh, Yaya Chi Chi Chan's uh, 2018 AppJ paper uh, did uh, consider hydrogen solidity and magma. And since our work, uh, um, Hilke Schlichting's group has also started looking at this issue. Um, but uh, 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 with, with them, we, as, we think that the capital subductions are mostly magma by mass and mostly atmosphere by volume. And we're going to explore the interactions. So uh, we need to consider both the dissolution of the gas into the magma and also uh, chemical reactions between the atmosphere and the magma. But we're going to do it in a simplified system where the only things that matter are hydrogen, oxygen, iron, magnesium, and silicon. Yeah. Uh, so we found that hydrogen dissolution into magma can explain the underabundance of exoplanets above uh, three Earth radius. So at three Earth radius, the base of atmosphere pressure becomes so large that the atmosphere can really easily dissolve into magma. And that means that if I keep adding hydrogen to the planet, most of it's going to just go in the magma. It's not going to puff up the planet much because each uh, uh, hydrogen molecule is, at a is uh, stirred down to high pressure where it doesn't contribute much to the planet's volume. So the key is that solubility increases exponentially when the hydrogen starts to become less compressible than ideal gas, which happens at a few gigapascals. So that means that fine tuning of gas supply is needed to make an exoplanet that's in the range three to six Earth radius. Um, if you add even more gas, you will eventually get a gravitational runaway and you will make a gas jet. But uh, the um, uh, but, but this simple picture uh, does explain the uh, radius uh, cliff. It's not the only idea out there for the radius cliff, um, but it is the simplest. And so uh, we're hopeful uh, that, um, uh, that this is the explanation for why nature wants to make a lot of two and a half Earth radius exoplanets, but strangely, very few that are four Earth radii, the size of Uranus and Neptune, our own solar system. Um, so what about if we include redox chemistry? So, uh, okay, so uh, this is a calculation, adding hydrogen to magma. Um, so on the left, uh, we have added a little bit of hydrogen to the magma. On the right, we've added a huge amount of hydrogen to the magma. Um, the, uh, the, the, it's a log scale. And what it's showing you is what is, uh, where is the hydrogen going uh, after you allow for uh, magma atmosphere uh, equilibration? When you don't add much uh, hydrogen, then the magma basically uh, turns almost all of that hydrogen into water. And because water is really soluble, uh, the water gets stored in the magma. But as I add more and more hydrogen, uh, the hydrogen uh, starts to swamp uh, the magma. Um, and so more and more of the hydrogen is stored um, in, in the atmosphere. And so you can see the redox, sorry, the atmospheric mean, mean molecular weight, uh, it gradually declines as you go through that process. So, um, so the fate of hydrogen and atmosphere composition are both determined by magma redox. So this, I'll get a different graph if I change the um, initial FeO content of the magma. How much does it vary? Well, in our own solar system, the FeO content of Mars and asteroid Vesta is uh, twenty weight percent in the um, uh, in the mantle, and on planet Mercury, although we do not have direct samples. Uh, there's compelling uh, uh, spectroscopic evidence, um, including um, including uh, gamma ray, X ray fluorescence, and so on, that the uh, iron oxide content of Mercury's metal is 0 0.1 weight percent or less. So there's 200 fold redox diversity just in the inner solar system for you know big rocky objects. Um, so um, a planet can be assembled from uh, pre oxidized planetesimals. Or the magma can be oxidized by loss of electrons to be alloy core, because silicon is more soluble in iron alloy than is oxygen. That's why we think that Earth's mantle has 10 weight percent FeO. Um, uh, mo mo most of the iron in the Earth is in the iron core, but there's quite a bit in the mantle. 
and it matters a lot for uh, uh, the redox state of Earth's atmosphere. Um, okay, and so uh, the purpose of uh, this study was to link um, things that we can measure, like the atmosphere mean molecular weight and the atmosphere uh, uh, hydrogen to water ratio um, to the origins of the volatiles. Um, and so um, shifting gears, um, we think that many super Earths were born as sub -Neptunes. And so does being born as a gas-rich sub -Neptune increase or decrease the chance that a super Earth will have an atmosphere made from solid derived volatiles? So um, uh, by the way, there have been no questions so far. Uh, 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 are, are there any questions so far? David, do you want to take questions? That, that's your call. Um, I do have a question, though. If sure, you want. yes, yes. You haven't used the word nitrogen. That's right. Um, so uh, um, uh, nitrogen solubility uh, uh, is very different if it's in you know, uh, NH3 or N2. Um, and even for Titan, uh, we have a fairly hazy grasp of why uh, Titan has uh, a thick uh, nitrogen atmosphere. Um, so that's why I've been focusing on uh, hydrogen and carbon species uh, so far. However, there are other uh, research groups that are looking at nitrogen. Um, it's partly um, it's partly a spectroscopic detectability thing. Like uh, you know, what are we what do we can see already? Carbon dioxide we can see with Webb. Um, so um, uh, um, the 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 main the the, the main reason to omit uh, nitrogen is just um, that from a cosmic chemical perspective, uh, you, you you expect it's easy to make a thick carbon dioxide atmosphere. It's easy to make a thick water atmosphere. It's relatively hard to make a, a really thick nitrogen atmosphere. Uh, good question. More questions? Uh, okay, uh, well, there'll be another chance uh, uh, um, at the end of the talk. So, um, um, so we built a simple uh, model of atmosphere evolution, including atmosphere loss to space, magma ocean crystallization, and volcanic outgassing. Um, so there are lots of errors here, so let me explain, explain what's going on. So um, time is running from left to right, so you're evolving the planet, it's log scale, um, and uh, the y-axis is showing you know, distance from the center of the planet, so um, the middle of the planet at some early time is down here. And um, so this is a cartoon, obviously, uh, but it shows the processes that attract the model. So we, we start out as a sudden entry with a thick hydrogen atmosphere, then we impose that the atmosphere is lost. Um, and then we ask, well, what's left? Is there anything left? Um, and there are two ways that something might be left. One way that something might be left is if we're adding uh, volatiles through uh, comet and asteroid delivery um, during the uh, 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 loss of the atmosphere, then some of those volatiles, some, will be protected because um, they'll partition into the solid uh, mantle as the Greenhouse effect from the hydrogen goes away, the magma ocean will crystallize, but as it crystallizes, it will trap some volatiles. Um, and so those volatiles are available for subsequent volcanic outgas. So that's one way something might be left. Another way something might be left is the distillation effect that I mentioned earlier. Um, if you're um, uh, blowing away a hydrogen wind, um, you can still have um, essentially gravitational uh, separation of the uh, heavy uh, high, high mean molecular weight constituents from the low mean molecular weight constituents. So maybe you can hang on to some volatiles that way. And you can also have protection by differential solubility. So, um, uh, the, uh, so we track which worlds smoothly evolve from primary to secondary atmospheres as the magma ocean crystallizes. We call, oh, we call those exalt atmospheres. Uh, which stay as bare rocks? Um, and which exhibits a volcanically revived atmosphere uh, for a range of uh, stellar masses, planet masses, stellar UV fluxes, distances from the star, and so on. Um, so the main simplifying assumption here is we didn't include chemical reactions. Instead, we uh, put in uh, a sort of chemically inert high molecular weight species as essentially a tracker, uh, although it did have effects on uh, the mean molecular weight of the atmosphere and so on, and just asked, 
how much of this high molecular weight species uh, survives this loss process. So we found that uh, when you're close to the star, so for temperatures, equilibrium temperatures greater than 400 Kelvin, which basically means receive more light from the star than Venus in our own solar system does today, um, then it's really hard uh, to, um, if you're a super Earth, uh, have a secondary atmosphere. Um, exalved uh, secondary atmospheres are swiftly lost, but you can do this um, uh, two-step where you, you, you lose all your rock, uh, sorry, you lose all your volatiles, you become a bare rock, but then the star quietens down. So now the, the, the extreme ultraviolet light from the star is less. So now you can safely volcanically outgas. And so in some cases, uh, we did see these revived volcanic atmospheres in our model. So putting it all together, we predicted that for M dwarf planetary systems, so low star mass, so sun like star is 1.0 on this plot, and M dwarf star is you know, anything less than about 0.5 on this plot, um, then uh, super Earths that have atmospheres close to the star, if we observe that these planets have um, uh, uh, atmospheres in, the, in, in, this, in this zone in the top left, then that means that they have, um, they have they must have formed with a lot of volatiles because the loss processes are really strong in this zone. Um, but, uh, um, uh, and so we, we suggested uh, targeting worlds mostly um, below and to the right of these lines if we want to find atmospheres. Um, but our model had simplifications and already there are studies, uh, updates to some of the processes in our model, which could shift these lines around. Uh, just a few weeks ago, uh, Nakayama et al, uh, did some updated uh, calculations of atomic line cooling uh, for high mean molecular weight atmospheres, such as our own, um, and argued that uh, the atomic line cooling protects the atmospheres by starting them from getting so hot and puffy that they are lost by hydrodynamic escape. That's a really important effect. And uh, including it in a model like ours would move these lines uh, uh, to upwards, basically, uh, so uh, protect, protecting secondary atmospheres. So that's a marker of how um, uh, the, 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 these, these models are useful for linking observations together and uh, taking a JWST observation of one planet and using it to generate a prediction for another planet. But they have a lot of um, uh, uncertain processes and uncertain parameters. Um, and so, uh, so we can't trust them yet. We have to uh, wait for JWST to tell us where these lines really should be. Um, OK. Um, so summarizing uh, this part of the talk, um, why are sub neptunes so abundant? Why are there so many 2.5 Earth radius objects in the universe? Uh, we argue that nonlinear solubility is the key. So if you get more massive than that, then the hydrogen, the pressure at the base of the hydrogen layer is so high that you, uh, it's easy to dissolve the extra hydrogen into the magma layer. Um, how does magma affect atmosphere composition? Uh, we uh, think that magma redox uh, sets the um, hydrogen to water ratio in the envelope of uh, small sub -Neptunes. And does being born as a sub increase or decrease uh, the chance that a super-Earth uh, will have a uh, secondary atmosphere? Um, for uh, hot super-Earths, um, we think that uh, you don't smoothly transition from a primary to a secondary atmosphere, but revived uh, volcanic atmospheres uh, um, are possible. Um, so, uh, you have a bare rock when the star is young and has high XUV, but later you could volcanically outgas an atmosphere. It has been speculated that Mars is an example of a world where that exactly happened, uh, but we need to spend a lot more time uh, unpicking the sedimentary uh, rock record of Mars and the isotopic uh, 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 record from Martian meteorites uh, to be able to test that hypothesis that Mars was a bare rock for hundreds of millions of years and then uh, outgassed an atmosphere relatively late. Um, so uh, thank you very much uh, um, for listening, and I'd be happy to take any questions. Thanks, Ed. Uh, if you've got questions, yeah. either you can raise your, your E hand, or you can just unmute yourself and go for it. Hi, Edwin. This is Chen. Hey. Sorry, I was I was late a little bit uh, for another meeting, and oh, my lab, my lab construction is going on. I might get interrupted. 
um, by the okay, construction. Sure. Yeah. Um, very nice talk, Edwin. I have a question for you know the hydrogen, the 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 planet side valley stuff you're talking about. So when you place um, hydrogen in the um, atmosphere, supposedly you have the magma ocean, right? Do you start with equilibrium or disequilibrium? Uh, so um, we, we we so the the the, the numerical. Uh, flow is uh, start out of equilibrium, um, and then uh, it's it's it, I mean it's a time stepping solver that I'm using, but I but I damp it I unphysically damp it just for numerical reasons. So uh, uh, so so does that answer your question or? Yeah yeah yeah. So if if you start with the disequilibrium, so does that mean all the um, sub neptune sized planets are out of equilibrium? If you take, you know, if we take your story to explain the size distribution of the planet, uh, no, that's not that's not a necessary assumption. That that for for kind of algorithmic convenience, that's how I do it. But all that is necessary is that uh, for 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 our plots to be correct, is that equilibration occurs. Uh, you know, in less than a few billion years. Now, mm -hmm. uh, is it is it? Do we know that equilibration occurs in less than a few billion years? No, we don't. Um, so uh, one way of visualizing the the the, the n members is uh, you can have each planet's interior structure be uh, a long-lived record of its own accretion. So basically, uh, uh, you know, if you go back all the way back to like 1950s and 1960s papers on how solar system rocky planets formed, this was the conceptual picture. So early on, you, each each new object is not falling very far, so it, it, it's quite cold. Uh, and then you have an inverted uh, temperature profile with hot stuff above cold stuff. Mm -hmm. So that we, we we no longer think of that as true for our solar system in part because of aluminum 26. Uh, but may, maybe that's like, uh, maybe that captures some truth for the sub -nutrition. That's one M member. If that M member is close to the truth, then our, um, our calculations are not describing real planets uh, because you would in fact have, uh, at that point, the core is, the, the magma is effectively chemically isolated from the envelope. And so the envelope is just, you know, solar composition or whatever, contaminated by some planet systems. The other M member, the one that we are focusing on, um, is one in which uh, the magma is stirred and the uh, envelope is also stirred uh, during the accretion process. And uh, uh, um, uh, under those conditions, uh, you can have chemical equilibrium between uh, growing magma layer and growing envelope. Does that answer your question, or was that? Not yeah, I can't speak right now. It's, there's a um, construction uh, just underneath my floor. Oh, I'm, so, I'm sorry. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Uh, yeah. Krista, your hands up. Yeah, hi. Thanks, Edwin, for the the nice talk. Since you're focusing on the the sub Neptunes, I was wondering if you might have some insights into the debate in terms of Venus and Neptune being ice giants versus rock giants. So I was wondering if you could comment on that. Sure, yeah, so this is a really interesting uh, question. So um, uh, from the, uh, the, the, the uh, so how do we know anything about the interiors of Uranus and Neptune, right? So uh, it's, it's difficult because they're cold, so most of the volatiles condense out below observational level. Um, so uh, gravity and magnetics are, are, are important. The gravitational J2, J4, everything that we have from the Voyager 2 flybys uh, can be matched by uh, uh, um, uh, rock over gas, uh, by, sorry, by gas over rock. And, and so the gravity alone does not require that the ice jets are ice jets. Um, however, the magnetic data, especially the um, octopole, or I mean, you know, the quadrupole to dipole ratio and the octopole to uh, dipole ratio for both Uranus and Neptune is more easily explained if uh, the magnetic field is launched at a relatively shallow level uh, within uh, the Eurus and Neptune's interiors, uh, which in turn is easy to explain if they've got a lot of ice, astrophysical ices, especially water. Um, finally, cosmochemically, uh, we, uh, um, although you can uh, construct a solar system in history in which Neptune and Jupiter swap places, it's easier to explain Neptune's current position in the solar system if it formed uh, external to its current location. Oh, sorry, they formed uh, external to Jupiter. And again, uh, that's um, uh, uh, more consistent with uh, Uranus and Neptune uh, having 
um, a mass budget that's mostly astrophysical ISIS. So, so um, does that answer your question, Crystal, or the other factors? Oh, no, I, I, I a part, I mean, not entirely, um, right. if I'm being honest, because like, I, I know those like kind of arguments based on like Uranus and Neptune themselves, but in terms of like the exoplanets, where it seems like there's a lot of rock potentially in sub-Neptunes, does that kind of suggest that there might be a lot more rock in Uranus and Neptune that are thought, because like the gravity doesn't require, you know, rocks are allowed, there could be a lot of it, like there's been a big debate in terms of, um, well, yeah, arguments like you just said in terms of that, and I'm just wondering if you look at these exoplanets, if that has any additional parts that you could take into account. Sure. Um, uh, 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 you know, my my uh, this is not speaking for the community, <laughs> but my personal opinion is that the uh, uh, the links between uh, um, an ice giant flagship mission and the exoplanets, uh, the subnatural exoplanets that I've been talking about today, uh, are, are really tenuous and weak. Uh, and, um, and and I don't think that uh, uh, you know I expect an ice giant mission will make interesting discoveries, but I, I, I doubt that they will be portable to exoplanets and vice versa. Why? Because uh, the orbital appearance is so different. Um, so uh, you, you're looking at a factor of, uh, what, 100, 1,000 difference in orbital period. Uh, the um, uh, you know, long range migration um, of the, um, uh, so, so I, 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 so I didn't talk much about the alternative hypothesis for the subject, which is that they do have a lot of water uh, H2O in, in, the, in their composition. So um, in order to make that happen, you have to migrate the subnutrients in a long way uh, from the ice line. Um, and so if, if that, um, uh, uh, um, so, if, uh, so if that's true, um, then there will be a stronger connection um, to, uh, your reception or own solar system. But my guess is that's not true. Well, thank you. Other questions? So, so I'll, I'll, I'll ask a quick one. So you, you uh, had a conception that you would be raising back the atmosphere with volcanism. But that is, what's the assumptions on, you know, are you, are you basically using a classic heat pipe? Are you, would, would we expect an even higher level if something approaching tectonics was occurring? What, where did, where did how much of a modeling component was that in, in your estimations? Uh, so it was a, uh, a parameterized mount convection model uh, with a, um, uh, uh, you know, uh, tons of type feedback, um, we consider both static and plate tectonic cases. Um, the um, uh, radiogenic heat budget was similar to Earth's, um, but so you know under the hood, there's probably a Euro ratio of 0.7 somewhere, something like that. Okay. Uh, which, which, as you know, does not work for the Earth, but you know. Um, so um, was that sort of what you were asking, or? Yeah, I was just trying to get a sense of the scale of that, like how much that's a dial that you could turn up or down based on the actual internal structure of the way the dynamics surface interactions occur. You know, if you if you crank that up a lot, then does that act, does the bare rock basically not happen because you shorten that time scale away? You know, uh, or mm -hmm. or does it length? You know, what, what's the feedback there? Yeah, that's a good question. So um, uh, I wouldn't call it super fine tuning, but a degree of good luck is required um, to um, have a volcanic revived atmosphere uh, in this cartoon picture. And the reason is that in this cartoon picture, the way that the volatiles get into the solid rock in the first place is their partition into the solid mantle during the magma ocean phase. Um, and uh, at the time they're partitioned into the mantle, you have a vigorous escape process because you're getting rid of the hydrogen layer in order to turn it from a sub-Neptune into a super. Okay. So the, the quasi-fine tuning is, if you then volcanically outgas really quick, then you're outgassing into an environment that still has a vigorous uh, um, loss process active, and so you'll just be lost. If you volcanically outgas too slowly, then uh, you know conceivably you just don't outgas enough to make a thick atmosphere before the uh, main signal's lifetime of the host direct. So uh, it turns out that based on near isotopes and a couple of other traces, 
we think that Earth's uh, mammal was not that vigorously mixed early in its history. And that the, um, so, you know, if I just take a parameterized box model and I run backwards in time, I get an exponential blow up with really fast volcanic degassing at early time. But if, if you do that to the Earth, then you get incorrect predictions for near DMA isotopes and a couple other systems. So, so I think that in the real, in the real galaxy, um, uh, mantles do overturn sluggishly enough that you can't hang on to your volatiles during this um, uh, dangerous phase and outgas them later. Um, but uh, you know how uh, how robust that is, you know, um, uh, it, it is not clear to me. In part because of the uncertainties you described. Yeah. Okay. So I guess uh, my my other question then links right to that would be, and then the additional the, the flux, if you will, you have a you know the flux of comets and asteroids in there, and you know in our own solar system we've talked about that flux being continuing to be high or having even you know late heavy bombardment kind of scenarios. You know, it seems like that could actually happen at a pretty critical time for this this argument. You know, if you had a whole lot more brought in at certain phases in here, you change the the potential that you ever have that exhaust atmosphere question. Oh yeah, like uh, there's so uh, there's the, there's so many areas that one could investigate. So one that you know um, shell thought is not the word, but you you, you know like um, uh, for for the late veneer. Uh, which is, you know, um, uh, the 0.5 weight percent of Earth's mantle that arrives after the moon-forming impact. We, like, almost by definition, the late veneer is stirred into the mantle, but is not stirred into the core, right? But, right. like, there's no <laughs> rule that the late veneer has to be stirred into the mantle. If you have some stagnation of the surface mantle exchange while the late veneer is still arriving, you now have essentially a chondritic in very loose definition of quadratic crust. And, and like, what does that do to an exoplanet's atmosphere is gonna be way more reducing than like what we normally think of as uh, a, a, as the atmosphere, right? So, so that, that's just an example of how um, relatively small perturbations um, to Earth story um, could, could, could lead to very different outcomes on exoplanets. Mm, that's great, thanks, yeah. Okay, uh, we have time for probably one more last question, if anybody has one. I have a question, Ed. In your magma ocean models, I mean, it sounds like you imagine them to be sort of very viscous, uh, sorry, very vigorously stirring. Is that correct? Well, the viscosity of magma above the liquid is as comparable to that of liquid water. So, uh, you know, viscosity is not what's controlling uh, whether convection is uh, vigorous or not. Um, but you could have compositional stratification in part because of the process I'm talking about. Um, so if I have um, a very um, uh, molecular hydrogen rich magma, it's going to be compositionally buoyant relative to underlying molecular hydrogen poor magma, and that could stratify the effectively inviscid magma ocean. I is that relevant to your question? Or well, I, guess, so I guess my question is, do you, I mean, do you envision as the magma ocean solidifies, do you imagine there's some sort of... Uh, Factional crystallization where you settle out or float phases, or do you assume they that solid phases or for that matter gases or liquid ion droplets remain suspended in what presumably is a rather vigorous convection yeah. process? Um, because I guess that affects how you se right, segregate things. Yeah. Um so uh I, 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 I will get to your question, but, but, but uh, just a quick thing, like um, uh, we didn't actually include the entrapment of volatiles behind a rapidly advancing uh, 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 crystallization front, which is Spiegelman and others have looked at, because the uh, rel relatively slow loss of the hydrogen envelope means that we have relatively slow magma ocean crystallization. Okay, the suspension thing is a red herring. Um, so you can easily do energetic arguments that like the suspension thing is not a big deal. Um, so, um, uh, we, we, have you, I mean, uh, are you referring to Lichtenberg's paper? Uh, I'm not aware that Tim would have done that, but he, he seems to hang out with the people. Yeah, no, I've just talked to some people that do lunar magma ocean. Sure. Uh, so, there seem to be two camps, those that want to sort of segregate, you solidify and you float stuff, whatever, and off the side, and you, I guess, sink the olivine. And then there's some people that, you know, whose fluid dynamics I typically don't have an argument with who seem to argue that, that you know, all of this stuff remains suspended and you're really forming this sort of mush. 
Okay, well, uh, I'm uh, I'm ignorant about the lunar magma ocean literature, but for the like um, the cases I'm talking about, if you go to the scalings in Solomitov and Stevenson's 1993 papers, uh, you know, uh, suspension uh, uh, suspension is 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 not is not going to be a major or long lived factor. Well, why is that? Because I mean, essentially, you need to. I mean, I guess it depends all on your particles. But I guess that goes back to my question. Do you assume it's this vigorously con convecting or not, right? And so as soon as the updraft velocities exceed this Stokes drag velocity, you're presumably suspending things, right? Yeah, so um, I guess uh, what, what, what one way of thinking about it is um, if a particle is suspended, um, then uh, you know, where is the energy coming from to prevent the state of the dense stuff falling to the bottom? And the energy is ultimately coming from the cooling of the system as a whole. And so that uh, puts an energetic constraint on how much stuff you can suspend for how long. Hmm. All right, well, we should probably uh, leave it there. <laughs> a lot for us to ponder. Um, and uh, thank Edwin one more time for, uh, for the talk. And uh, hopefully next time we can get you down in person. Yeah, totally. Yeah. Thank you very much. Yeah. All right. Thanks. So.